interrupting Aubrey's Esther series um, in order to talk about another amazing woman of faith, Ruth, and an unlikely friend that she made, her mother-in-law, Naomi. And since Valentine's Day is around the corner, and youth tell me that's very awkward, um, (laughs) we're going to be talking about a different kind of love, and that is the love of a friend. And I have some amazing friends who I call my sisters in Christ, Um, but I struggled to make friends in grade school. Um, I was very shy, and kids can be cruel. I had values and beliefs, and I wasn't willing to give that up in order to swear to be cool or walk through the mud if you're a cool person. That's a true story. Um, Or I wasn't willing to be mean to someone or leave someone out in order to be someone else's friend. Um, so I was labeled as a brown noser, goody two shoes, um, you're so good, Steph, but I don't want to play with you. Um, <laughs> not many people wanted to hang out with me. Uh, in high school and university, things were different. It was easier, it got better um, to make friends. I found it pretty easy. We had common, common experiences, classes, interests, same phase of life, generally, um, and I found a huge community of Christians in university uh, to call my people and to do life with, many of uh, who I still do. Um, as an adult, I lived in Lesotho, Africa, and then Toronto, and I found it difficult, again, to find community. Um, but man, I really tried. Um, we moved back to Cambridge just before the pandemic in search of community, returning to our childhood church home uh, where Matt and I met. Uh, We thought it was going to be great. We'd just have great dinners and talks and hang out and run small groups, and then the pandemic hit, Um, and there was no community. I have many good friends, as I said, from my school time in Ottawa and in Toronto, but none of them are local, so the past year or so has been very sweet to be able to get to know many of you and go out for coffee and learn something new about you, um, reach out to people again. Uh, but that can also be hard, right? Making new friends is scary. You have to be vulnerable. Uh, you have to take a risk. Um, you have to walk up to someone, introduce yourself. There's fear of rejection. Um, you have to ask meaningful questions and plant the seeds for a friendship. And our youth, uh, they've told me social interactions have been a lot harder for them um, post-pandemic. They feel nervous uh, when they don't know the people around them, and they're scared to reach out to someone new. So we've been talking about that in Youth youth Zone um, and what it means to be born into the image of God and then be an image bearer in their school community at home. So my go-to move for making friends is starting a women's Bible study. I've done it in every place I've lived, um, and I got to start one at Central, a young woman's Bible study, um, this past fall. And so far, there's eight of us, and we're from three different decades, different seasons of life, um, but it works. Uh, We meet after church at my house once a month, we have a meal, we chat, and we study the Word. And we're just about to start our third study in a few weeks. And it's been the biggest blessing. Some of my Bible study friends are here, and they're going to help me with uh, today's scripture passage. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Ruth chapter 1. The book of Ruth is such a rich, multi-layered story, my favorite kind. There's metaphor and meaning and promise There's salvation, and spoiler alert, there is a happy ending. So a little background. So the mother-in-law, Naomi, was an Israelite, but due to famine, her and her family left Israel, the land that God had delivered them to, in order to seek what they thought would be a better life in a place called Moab. The book of Ruth is set in the time of Judges, as many of you probably know. It was a period of social and religious chaos. Um, in the absence of a king. It was a time not unlike today when everyone did what seemed right to him. Years pass. Naomi and her husband have two sons. They get married. Um, But then Naomi's husband dies. And soon after that, her two sons die as well. 
Naomi and her daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, were left as widows. Naomi believed that God had forgotten her, and she became bitter. She had no choice but to seek refuge in her hometown of Bethlehem. So this brings us to our tearful goodbye between Naomi and her daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, as she tries to send them back to their families. And Rachel and Lene are going to help us out, and they're going to read from Ruth 1, 8 to 17. Girls, just come over here. All right. Thank you. Just come a little bit more, Lene. There you go. Camera is here. Naomi said to them, each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. She kissed them, and they wept loudly. They said to her, We insist on returning with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Return home, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Am I able to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Go on, for I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me to have a husband tonight and to bear sons, would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourselves from remarrying? No, my daughters, my life is much too bitter for you to share, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Again they wept loudly, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, Don't plead with me to abandon you, or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me, and do so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Thank you. Thank you, Bible study buddies. (laughs) Great. So, Naomi told her daughter-in-laws to go back to their families of origin, uh, but Naomi won the jackpot of daughters-in-law. Her daughters in love were loyal and pleaded to stay with her, but Naomi said she doesn't want them to stay with her. She's going to have a bitter life. Her life is over. She's going to live in despair and hopelessness. In the end, one of them, Orpah, obliges and returns to her people, but Ruth stays by Naomi's side. Life is not too bitter or too messy or too broken to share with a friend. Some of us think friendship should be easy and neat and tidy and and fun, and and it should be fun, but then when it isn't and we have a disagreement with someone or someone gets sick, or struggles with their mental health, or your buddy messes up, or you feel ignored and forgotten, we can think, oh well, it doesn't matter. I don't need him. But friends aren't disposable. Friends are made in the image of God, just like you and I. Paul writes to the Colossians, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3.13. The author of Proverbs writes, Oil and incense bring joy to the heart, and the sweetness of a friend is better than self-counsel. Proverbs 27.9. So it's better to forgive a good friend than let them go. No one is too different or too difficult or too much or too whatever to call a friend. God calls us to love one another. So back to our unlikely besties. Uh, Ruth and Naomi. They traveled to Bethlehem, and as a widow and a foreigner, Ruth the Moabite was taking a huge risk. She was vulnerable. At this time, women didn't have many rights, and they needed a man to provide for them. Nevertheless, Ruth stayed with Naomi. Why? Because Naomi's God was Ruth's God. Ruth had faith that they would be okay because they were covered in God's hesed or steadfast love. And you can see the Hebrew letters up there that says hesed. The word hesed is used roughly 250 times in the Old Testament. And it's one of the key descriptors of God's character. Hesed, steadfast love, covenant of grace. 
God's promise to us. Has said reminds us he will never leave us or forsake us. Has said shows us that God is unwavering. No matter if he's rejected or we tell him we're bitter against him, he is there. He is steadfast. He's telling a good story and he is in control of the narrative. The book of Ruth is also full of the Hebrew word shub, and maybe I'm saying that wrong, Aubrey will correct me later, which means to return, to restore, to revive. And these three R's point to God's covenant grace, his hesed, his steadfast love in calling his prodigals home. No matter if they rejected God's promised land like Naomi or were a Gentile like Ruth, the story of Ruth shows us that we are all wanted. We are indeed known by the King, the Creator who knit us together in our mother's wombs. Ruth and Naomi's return to Bethlehem shows that foreigners or not ethnic Israelites could be incorporated into the kingdom of God through faith. If Ruth could be accepted by God, it proved there was hope for all Gentiles. The story of Ruth whispers to us, you belong, you are known, I love you, I will not abandon you or forsake you, I will be your God. And God is the goat of best friends, amen? And if you don't know what that means, I encourage you to find a new friend at coffee time who is between the ages of 12 and 18. Uh, it's one of the key slang words right now at youth. Um, Ruth was a friend to Naomi, an unlikely friend. When they arrived in Bethlehem, Ruth's faithful commitment to God and her mother-in-law helped her gain favor with a man named Boaz. Boaz, son of Rahab, yep, that Rahab with a red rope, remember, hope is a rope, whose family was spared by God when the walls of Jericho came crashing down because Rahab chose to follow God instead of the earthly king. God had shown Boaz and his family grace, his hesed. Boaz was not identified by his mother's past, but by his integrity. Boaz did not identify Ruth as a foreigner or a widow, but by her faith. He spoke to her with dignity and honor. And she was of the lowest class. She was a widow and a foreigner. She was a Gentile. But like her, God made every single person in this room, in his image, crowned with glory and honor. Psalm 8. Ruth asked Boaz if he would redeem her father-in-law's land and take her as his wife. And he said yes. But he was not first in line to be what in biblical times was called uh, the kinsman redeemer. In those days when a man died, his possessions and family became the property of the next closest male relative, most often a brother. Another man was in line of Bo in front of Boaz um, to inherit the land, but when he heard that in order to redeem the land, he would have to also care for someone else's mother-in-law and um, daughter-in-law, he said, no way. I don't, want I don't want that responsibility. No way. No thank you. And he passed the role to Boaz, and Boaz accepted it gladly. Grace has said God's covenant with us. Naomi's family redeemer did not want the responsibility of caring for someone else's wife and daughter-in-law. He was not a friend to Naomi, but this allowed Boaz to take that place. And as family redeemer, Boaz married Ruth and redeemed Naomi's husband's land as their inheritance. He would make sure Ruth and Naomi were cared for for the rest of their lives. Boaz, Boaz's choices reflect Jesus. His life points us to his said, God's steadfast love for us. We are welcomed. We are favored. We are redeemed. God makes outcasts, son, daughters and sons. He makes foreigners, citizens of heaven. He makes strangers, friends. Boaz welcomed two widows into his family and committed to care for them as their family redeemer. And this is like extra significant because Israel was at war with Moab for hundreds of years, and even in the future, Ruth's great-grandson, King David, would spend most of his life at war with the Moabites. 
Um, so Ruth was taking, being a Moabite herself, an, an tremendous risk in line with the customs of the time. She could be raped, killed, or enslaved as an enemy foreigner. There was a risk, too, that Naomi might die, leaving Ruth all alone without any family ties. Um, and that would mean Ruth was sacrificing having a new husband, having children, and possibly living a life in extreme poverty. A very difficult life. But the unlikely friendship between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, led Ruth to marry Boaz, have children, and their friendship created the way for Ruth's descendants to become royal Israelites. Her great-grandson would become King David, not to mention the most important king coming 14 generations later, Jesus Christ himself. Ruth's unlikely friendship transformed her life. God restored Ruth and Naomi's lives. In Bethlehem, God made provisions for them, a place to stay, to eat, a family redeemer, and a hope for a good future after everything they had been through. By following God, they were able to write a good story for their lives rather than giving up and living just as their identity as a widow, hopeless and in despair. And our lives can point to that same grace and love that Ruth poured over Naomi. When we treat others with dignity and respect, when we see the eyes of faith that they were made in God's image, when we make someone a friend, we need to pray for eyes of faith to see who God is placing on your path. Because I don't know about you, but I get something called spiritual amnesia when I wake up in the morning and I forget who I am and just like do the things I want to do and don't see people around me. And I can just be very focused. Um, I need to get this done. This person's in my way. But this person, Shay's laughing at me, um, this person is made in the image of God. And I was called to be an image bearer and therefore they are worth, worthy of dignity and respect. They are crowned with the same glory and honor that I am. We need to pray for eyes of faith, to see who God is placing on your path. Who has he given you a heart for? How different would your life look if you entered work school, your community, your home with eyes of faith. I want to tell you about another unlikely friendship. Now, I know I shared about my brother last time, but in my family, we live for what we call Greggy stories. <laughs> and he's sitting over there. If you could put the next slide up, Ted. There's me and Greg. Um, Greg has many best friends. How many best friends do you have, Greg? like 10, but he has one best, best, best friend. That's what he calls them, and his name's Josh. That's Josh and Greggy when they were really little. They met in kindergarten. Josh came up to Greg, or Greg came up to Josh, and they've been buddies ever since. Greg brought Josh to Central's youth group. Josh, who isn't from a Christian home, found Christ, and it radically changed his life and his path. I got to watch it in, unfold in real time and then be part of his university experience as well. It's pretty cool. Josh was a foreigner to the church, but God used Greg to lead him to Christ. If you want to go to the next slide, Ted. Greg was the best man at Josh's wedding, and Josh will do the same for Greg when he marries Bree. The world looks at Josh and wonders, why is he friends with someone like Greg? The Moabites look at an aging Naomi and wonder why Ruth doesn't cut ties with her mother-in-law and go back to her family. Has said, because God's covenant love. Greg and Naomi acted as image bearers when they shared the love of their God with Josh and Ruth. They now know the great Redeemer through their friendships, and God has blessed them in countless ways. Josh and Ruth were and are the most loyal of friends. And we all long for that, right? We all long for belonging and authentic friendships, or at least I do. The book of Ruth teaches us that we are all wanted. 
We belong to a club that is always accepting members. Amen? The kingdom of God. I'll finish up with this. Three times a year, Central's youth make gifts and write cards for our homebound members, our members who are no longer able to make it to church on Sunday mornings. And the cool thing about this is the homebound members write back. Denise has a huge stack of cards, and we bring them out uh, when we make these bags, and we show the kids, and they love looking at them, and, and you see some shaky handwriting, you see some beautiful handwriting um, that, that someone has helped one of our members write, and, and we really get to see that we are bringing hope and light to those who are struggling and are, are facing really difficult things. Has said, God's covenant grace, he is steadfast. God loves unlikely friendships. I'm sure of that. So, now, a call to action. Does everyone have one of those Valentines you received when you walked in today? Can you show me? Okay, show me. Good. If you don't have one, you can check at the back if there's any left, and Carrie will will get you one. Okay, cool. You've got them. You were listening. No one's asleep. Um, So, That Valentine you received, unfortunately, the Reed's chocolate is not for you. (laughs) Sorry. Um, It is for you to give to an unlikely friend. Is there someone the Spirit has been prompting you to reach out to, to talk to at work, to help do something, to invite into your small group or your book club, um, or eat lunch with at school, or partner with for a class project? Is there someone who's left out in your circles that you walk in? Have you ever been left out? I have. And the point of this is to help people who feel left out and to make them feel wanted as they truly are. We know the truth. And don't you want everyone in your life to know the truth? Don't you want them to know that they're loved and that they can return home at any time? Maybe God has equipped you with exactly what they need to know the great Redeemer. Ruth ends with a beautiful scene. Naomi is holding her new grandchild, Obed, And the local women are cooing over him, and they affirm God's provision in Naomi's life and in the lives of her descendants. For Obed Obed was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, and 14 generations later comes our Savior, Jesus Christ. God weaves the story of redemption through the lives of broken people, awkward people, bitter people, And I'm just going to read Ruth 4, 14 to 17, as we finish here today. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons, and she has given birth to him. Naomi took the child and placed him on her lap and became his nanny. The neighbor women said, A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. God's redeeming love. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we are currently sitting in a room full of potential friends. Lord, I pray that unlikely friends could come together today and this week in workplaces, in schools, in the community, wherever we find ourselves, that we would listen to the prompting of your spirit telling us, go tell them they belong, they're wanted, they're seen, they're known. And let us too know that deep inside our hearts, Lord. Let us bury these truths of who we are, what our identity truly is, an image bearer, a child made in the image of God. Lord, let us have eyes of faith to see those in our life who are hurting, who are struggling, who need to know that they are loved. 
We commit this all to you, Lord, in the name of your amazing Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.